Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this is the day that you have made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. Lord, we thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which has given us eternal life, washed us from all of our sins, past, present, and future, because you have given us grace. Hallelujah. You have chosen us before the foundations of the world to inherit glory. And we say thank you, Lord, and stand in faith, knowing that what you promised, you will also bring to pass, because you are the truth. Hallelujah. And it's impossible for you to lie. And so, Lord, we thank you for everything that you are doing in our lives, have done in our lives, and will do in our lives. We thank you for the anointing. We pray that we would have a fresh and a new anointing today. May our cup run over, hallelujah, from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet so that we can shine as lights in this evil and dark world through the power of the Holy Spirit, which rests, rules, and abides in all truly born-again believers. So, May we decrease so that you can increase. May you open up our minds, our hearts, our understanding to see great and mighty things in your word that we do not know. Give us insight and revelation, Lord Jesus Christ, into your word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for already answering our prayers because you are going to lead us and guide us into all truth. And we say hallelujah. Lord, we pray that you would set a hedge of protection around each and every one of us. For those who don't know you, we pray that they would come to know you by any means necessary. Would you get their attention before the evil and dark day comes? And Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we pray that you would protect us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. For thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. And we pray and ask this all in the name above all names, Jesus the Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Well, thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Opened, Everything Will Change. And I want to continue to let the Holy Spirit teach us what He has in His Word. And the Bible confirms the Bible. And so this teaching continues to hammer home the same story that God has told repeatedly in his word, which is that God is going to rapture the dead in Christ and those who are alive when it happens before any of the trouble comes upon the planet. And we see this story told in the Old Testament and because God has told us the end from the beginning, the story that's told in the Old Testament through Moses and Elijah confirms what the revelation is in the New Testament. And so let us go into the word of God so that we can see that God is not a man that he should lie. Hallelujah. For if God says that he tells us from ancient times things not yet done, well, we should see from ancient times in the word of God, the story told that he's declared unto us at the end, from the beginning. Hallelujah. And so I want to start off with 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. 
For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we see that the Apostle Peter is telling us that we can understand, hallelujah, we can understand what God is going to do because we have a more sure word of prophecy, hallelujah, a more sure word of prophecy. And that sure word of prophecy is contained in the Bible, which rebukes all cunningly devised fables. People who say that there's no rapture, people who say that the rapture comes at the end of the tribulation, people who say that the rapture comes at the midpoint of the tribulation, people who follow cunningly devised fables speak from their own interpretation. This scripture right here proves it because this scripture tells us that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Those who say that the pre-tribulation rapture is false, they have a private interpretation of the prophecy of scripture, which is a false interpretation. Because God has told us, God has told us the end from the beginning, because the prophecy did not begin with the will of men, but it was by the Holy Ghost that the prophecy was written. And because the Holy Ghost was in charge of writing the 66 books that we have in the canonization of Scripture, it's the Holy Spirit that has interwoven the same story throughout the whole entire Bible, that the pre-tribulation rapture is true. And Peter points us to the evidence when he said that he saw, hallelujah, he saw the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we can point to when he saw the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he was an eyewitness of that majesty when he saw Jesus Christ transfigured on the mount. And when he saw Jesus Christ transfigured on the mount, who appeared next to Jesus? Moses and Elijah. And so Moses and Elijah are our two witnesses that confirm the pre-tribulation rapture. And I just want to go over the evidence to continue to hammer home the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture to give us continual ammo to come against by the power of the Holy Ghost, cunningly devised fables. Everything that goes against the truth is a lie, okay? I don't care if it's uh, a well-intended uh, 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 devised fable, okay? Well-intended devised fables lead to hell, okay? Because once you start down... Uh, a path that is a lie, there's no telling where the devil will lead you, okay? Now, I'm not saying that those who believe in um, a rapture that's going to take place at the end of the tribulation or at the midpoint are not saved, because we're only saved by the power, uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, by his death, burial, and resurrection, faith in that, faith in what he did for us on the cross, uh, that's the gospel, okay? We're saved by grace through faith. And so we can't add anything to that, okay? Nothing can be added to what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. All we have to do is say yes. And that's going to come up into, into this teaching as well. But the matter and the issue at hand is that cunningly devised fables lead to great error because once you believe a lie there there's a lot that goes into believing a lie that can bring you down a path where you're open up to all types of cunningly devised fables which will lead you away from the truth and so in order to combat that we have to be valiant for the truth by standing upon what 
thus saith the Lord. Hallelujah. And so let's look, look at what's going to happen at the end. And so let's go to the New Testament revelation. And so we could paint the picture in order to go back to the Old Testament revelation. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses 16 through 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, so that's the rapture. And God tells us that there's going to be those who have died in Christ who are going to rise first. And then there's going to be those who are alive and remain when it happens, who are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet our Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So in order for the Bible to be right, according to Second Peter, that there's no prophecy of the scripture of any private interpretation and if all cunningly devised fables are going to be defeated we should understand that god will tell us this story in the old testament he will give us some type of shadow some type of story that's interwoven in the old testament where this story is played out before it ever happens Hallelujah. And so our two witnesses that Peter uh, hints at is when he saw the coming and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that story is, of course, when Peter, James and John were told to go up to the mount with Jesus Christ, the Mount of Transfiguration. So that is our text and understanding that Moses and Elijah were also there with Jesus when he was transfigured, we have to understand who Moses and Elijah was. So Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse five says this. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural forces abated. Okay, so here we see that Moses died, and Moses was buried, and Moses was 120 years old when he died. Okay, so Moses died, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. So Moses represents those who have died in the Lord. And so let's go to Elijah. How about Elijah? What happened to him? 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I be taken away from you. And Elisha said, I pray you, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken away from you, it shall be unto you. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So here goes Elijah. Elijah never died. He was taken up alive by a whirlwind into heaven when those chariots of fire and horses of fire appeared. And so we have our two witnesses. One died, Moses. One went to heaven. Elijah. First Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us that when the Lord comes, the dead will rise first. Moses was, he lived before, Moses lived before Elijah. And so Moses represents the dead because he died first. And so Moses, is, Moses died, so he represents the dead in Christ. Elijah appeared after Moses. And so 
Elijah represents those who are alive and remain when the rapture event happens. And so these two witnesses also continue to tell us the story because both of these witnesses, Moses and Elijah, they were taken to a cave and both saw the Lord pass by. And look at how the details are contained in both of those revelations as we go through it. So let's start with Moses. Moses was, um, he asked to see the glory of the Lord. So let's read this account here in Exodus chapter 33, the glory of the Lord. And Moses said unto the Lord, see, thou sayest unto me, bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you, that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. So we see that it's all about grace. OK, uh, Moses is asking God for grace and he's standing in faith. So we see a picture that uh, uh, Moses, uh, those who uh, all who are who believe in Jesus were saved by grace through faith. God has to show us grace and we stand in faith and we're saved. So we see this Old Testament shadow of grace and faith here with Moses and verse 14. And he said, uh, my presence shall go with you and I will go with and I will give you rest. And he said to, and he said unto him, if your presence goes not with me, carry us not up there. For wherein shall it be known here that I and your people have found grace in your sight? Is it not that you go with us? So shall we be separated, and I and your people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, I beseech you, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, You cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put you in a cliff of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. And I will take my hand away and you shall see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Okay, so we see that God is about to let Moses see um, the back parts of him as Moses is put into a cliff of a rock and Moses is hidden from seeing the face of the Lord as the Lord passes by. And this all comes because God gives Moses grace as Moses believes in faith. Hallelujah. We are saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God. Okay, this, is, was, this was a gift that God gave to Moses. Okay, because Moses had faith uh, to even ask God for this awesome and mighty gift. And this was a revelation of what's going to happen at the end times. And so let's go to the next chapter, Exodus chapter 34, because we see, um, we see a, a, another shadow of the renewed covenant. Because remember, this story takes place after um, the children of Israel had, had worshiped the golden calf and Moses had came down with the original tablets with the Ten Commandments on it, and uh, he broke it. Moses threw down uh, the, the first set of tablets because the law can't be kept. It was broken, okay? It was broken by the people, okay? Moses didn't even come into the camp. He saw the people from afar off as he was coming. He saw that the people were engaged in revelry. They rose up to eat and drink and play before that golden calf. And so as Moses was coming down the mountain, he saw uh, the wickedness that the children of Israel were engaged in. 
and he threw down the, the, those tablets at, at the bottom of the mount because if Moses would have went into the camp with that with those tablets the law is death okay the whole nation would have been wiped out when the law entered into the camp okay those those, those 10 commandments would have wiped everyone out okay because the law shows us that we're sinners but Moses uh he he broke the stone tablets before even getting to the camp okay because if he would have went into the camp with those uh two uh, stone tablets the whole camp of Israel would have been wiped out okay but here we see right before God passes by Moses we see that Moses is instructed to take two uh, new sets of tablets, which represents the new covenant, the renewed covenant, okay? The covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a shadow, okay? Because uh, uh, we've already broken uh, that first covenant, okay? We've already broken the laws of God, and uh, we can't keep it. It's impossible to keep it because of our sinful nature, because if we don't, e if we fail to, uh, to even keep one of them perfectly, we've, we're guilty of breaking it all. Okay, and uh, sin equals death, and therefore God, hallelujah, as he tells us in Exodus 33, that he, he gives us compassion, and he gives us mercy. Uh, what, what did he say right here in Exodus 33, verse 19? And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You see, it's not us who wills, okay? But it's God who gives grace. It's God who shows mercy. It's all uh, God's plan, okay? It's God's plan. Hallelujah. God is the one who's in control. God is the one who's sovereign. God is the one who elects. God is the one who predestines. God is the one who gives us eternal life. Hallelujah. Because he's the one who chooses. For many are called, but only few are chosen. Okay, no one can boast in the presence of God. It's God who's in control. And it's God who has given us the greatest gift in all of human history, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, because he's been gracious unto us. He's shown us mercy, hallelujah. You see, that should make all of us shout for joy because he chose us. He didn't leave us unto ourselves. He didn't leave us to fend for ourselves and therefore uh, spend an eternity lost in the lake of fire. But he chose us, hallelujah, before the foundations of the world. He chose us before he said, let there be light, and there was light, because the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. God knew who was going to be saved before he made any of what he made. He's God. He knows the end from the beginning, and now here we are at the end of human history, and God is about to complete the greatest story ever told. Hallelujah. And so let's go to Exodus 34, verse 1. Let's see this, this shadow with Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the fir first tables, which you broke. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with you, Neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord God commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. 
Hallelujah. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. So we see that the Lord passed by. The Lord passed by Moses after Moses was told to go up into the mount and hide himself in the cliff of the rock. And once Moses did that, and he had the two tablets of stone, which represented, uh, which represents the new covenant, because only those who are in Christ are going to be part of this great event. So Moses represents that new covenant uh, in this in this uh, shadow right here. And uh, once Moses is safely inside uh, inside the cliff uh, on top of the mount, the Lord descends in the cloud. Okay, so that's exactly what we read in First Thessalonians. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Moses represents the dead in Christ who are, who are going to rise first. Hallelujah. And so here goes Moses. And as the Lord passes by, the Lord proclaims uh, this wonderful word, of what he's all about. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And so for the dead in Christ, all of the saints who have gone before us, they represent this vision of what happened with Moses. Okay, notice how there's no mention of the wind, no mention of the earthquake, no mention of the fire in this vision because the dead in Christ have already gone. Their souls are in the presence of King Jesus. Okay, so they're just waiting for their body to be reunited with their soul. And so uh, this represents how they will see uh, the cloudy day happen, okay? There's no mention of the, the wind, the earthquake, and the fire because they've already died, okay? But now for those who are alive and remain, because remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says that there's also going to be people who are alive and remain that are going to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So for those of us who are alive and remain, we see a, a we see a, the, the complete picture of what happens on that day. And we see that story told in 1 Kings chapter 19 when Elijah was told to go up into the mount and enter into the cave as the Lord passed by. And so we know in 1 Kings chapter 18, which is where the cloud begins, because remember, there always has to be a cloud. Okay, as we saw in Exodus, Exodus 34, uh, verse 5, and the Lord descended in the cloud, okay, when this happened with Moses. So there has to be a cloud mentioned in, in, in the story of Elijah because God is telling us a more sure word of prophecy. There's no private interpretation. The Holy Spirit is the one who's, who wrote all of this down for us. And now because we have uh, the complete revelation, we can see the total picture of God. Hallelujah. And so here we see the cloud first mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 18. And with the unnamed servant of Elijah going up to the top of the mount and looking out towards the sea seven times. And so this unnamed servant of Elijah represents, of course, the Holy Spirit and the seven spirits of God. Okay, the seven spirits of God is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And at the seventh time that this unnamed servant went up to the top of the mount, verse 44 tells us this, And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. Okay, so there goes the cloud mentioned, okay, because we're, we're, we're looking at the shadow, okay, the, uh, the shadow of the end times portrayed in this story. So we got the mention of the cloud. And so now we go to 1 Kings chapter 19. And we see um, down here, uh, well, first we see Elijah flees Jezebel. So I've explained that before, but this represents all those who overcome in the church of Thyatira. And 
in general, everyone who overcomes in the seven churches, because only those who overcome are, are granted the promises that are contained in the promises to the churches, to the seven churches in the book of Revelation chapters two and three. And so Elijah represents those who have overcome Jezebel, because only those who have overcome by the uh, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony, uh, we are the only ones who are going to be able to go up because Elijah represents those who are alive and remain when it happens. We who are alive and remain today, we are represented by Elijah because Elijah never died. He went up into heaven without ever dying. So he represents us, the body of Christ today. And so Moses, I mean, uh, Elijah goes up to a cave, uh, First Kings chapter 19, verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and slain your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice okay and so here we see the perspective of those who are alive and remain when the rapture happens okay so just like moses elijah was told to go up to a to a mountain and stand upon a mountain in in a cave it's the same thing that moses did in exodus okay and as um, Elijah goes into this mount on top of uh, on top of the mountain inside the cave, uh, he's he he's safe inside. Uh, he's protected. He's protected. Okay, he's protected. Just like we, as the body of Christ, we're going to be protected. But because we understand the complete total revelation of God, we know what's going to happen for those who are left behind. You see, Moses, he represents those who have already died, okay? They didn't see the complete picture like we see it today, but they still receive the same promise, okay? That's why, from their perspective, when the Lord passes by, uh, it's nothing, uh, it's no mention of the wind and the earthquake and the fire, okay? They've already long been dead, okay? And so when they rise up, they're just going to understand, uh, you know, what, what the Lord says. Hallelujah. But for us who are alive and remain, we, we're, we're seeing the, 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 we're seeing the whole picture come to fruition as we speak. We see the peace plan. We see Israel back in the land. We see Gog and Magog on the northern border. We see the corruption of Babylon the Great. Okay. Uh, we see how, just like Elijah, he, he feels like he's the only one left because many people have forsaken the covenant, okay? We see the apostasy. We see everything that's going on. We see that the earthquake is coming. We see that the wind is coming. We see that the fire is coming. Those who are children of light, those who have oil in their lamp, those who understand the signs of the times, you see? Oh, it's just so much. It's just so much. It's, but you see, but as we can see, hallelujah, we see everything about to happen because we are the generation of the end, okay? This is the final generation. And so, therefore, in the revelation, in the revelation that God contained in the Old Testament, we see the contrast for those who have already died, which represents Moses, okay, from those who are going to be alive and remain at the time it happens. But 
even with this different perspective from the different groups of people, it's still the same message because both went on top of a mount, both were hidden in a cave, and both saw the Lord pass by. And even for those who understand that there's going to come the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, we're still not going to be affected by it because as Elijah was safe inside the cave, so too will we who are alive and remain be safe when it happens because we're going to be caught up. Hallelujah. We're going to be caught up. Hallelujah. We're going to be caught up together with the dead in Christ to meet them in the clouds as we meet our Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. You see, and so we see this picture played out, of course, in the New Testament with the transfiguration. And this story is told in the three Gospels. In Mark, Luke, and Matthew, this same story is told. And it's always the same order. It's always the same order. First, Peter confesses Christ. Then Jesus predicts his death. Then he tells us to take up our cross, and then the transfiguration happens. And then Jesus heals a boy with an evil spirit. And so let me just go over this real quick. So when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, that represents all of us. Because everyone who's going to be part of the rapture, whether you're dead or alive, we all have to confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Christ. And then... After we confess that Jesus is the Christ, we believe in what he did because Jesus then predicts his death, okay? Uh, he died for us, and on the third day he rose from the dead, okay? So if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, like Peter, and if we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, Jesus predicts his death, what's going to happen? We shall be saved. And what happens as part of working at our salvation with fear and trembling, we take up our cross, you see? Because if anyone will come after Jesus, it doesn't just stop with you confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, okay? Many people have a profession, but they don't have a possession of the Holy Spirit. Somebody may have said a prayer when they were uh, 10 years old, but then as they grew older, what happened? They, they, there's no fruit. There's no evidence. Okay. This is a continual walk. You have to walk. We have to walk. We have to take up our cross and follow him. That's what separates the, the wise virgins from the foolish virgins. The five wise virgins, we have oil. We have the Holy Ghost. But the five foolish, they don't have any oil. They have no Holy Ghost. They have no Holy Spirit. And if you don't got the Holy Spirit, you're going to be left behind. That's what the Bible says. Because when the bridegroom comes and you're not ready, the door's going to be shut. That's what the Bible says. Okay? You could argue semantics, but let God be true and every man a liar. Okay, I'm going to believe what God says. If you ain't got no oil, if you ain't got the Holy Spirit, you ain't going up in the rapture. That's it. That's all. That's what the Bible says. Okay, therefore, we got to do it like God says to do it. Okay, I don't want to, I don't want my faith and it's not going to stand in the wisdom of men. My faith will not stand in the wisdom of men, but my faith will stand in the power and the wisdom of almighty God. To the power of the living God, the Holy Spirit, who's given unto everyone who calls upon his name. You see, because if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. You see, if you truly are born again, you will take up your cross. You see, but God says that what, what, what was the first thing he told us in Matthew? Oh, see. God, this is what God wants to speak, so I'm not going to I'm not going to apologize for this. Look at what God says in Matthew 24. What's the first thing he tells us after the disciples asked him about his coming and the end of the world? What's the first warning God said? Matthew 24 verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, "Take heed 
that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. This is, this is what God says, okay? This is God, hallelujah. This is the word of God. This is the first thing he said. This is the first thing he said in regards to the sign of his coming in the end of the world. His first warning was to take heed that no man deceives you. You see, you can play all these semantic games if you want. But I refuse. <laughs> I refuse because the Holy Spirit is in me. I refuse to be deceived. Hallelujah. I'm valiant for the truth because God is true. And therefore, I stand upon what the Bible says. You could play semantics. You could play these games. Hallelujah. Uh, but if you want to play these games, uh, that's on you. I'm going to stick to what the Bible says. Okay. And what God says go. If you want to argue semantics and you want to argue this and that, okay. I'm sticking to what the book says, no matter what anybody says. Hallelujah. And I know you out there who's listening to this teaching, I know that you are also going to stick to what the book says. Don't listen to the opinions of man. Don't listen to what I think and what uh, I, I think and I, I think. No, what does God say? Okay. What does God say? You believe what God says. That's it. That's all. And if what God says is not in the word of God, you throw it out as rubbish. Okay. You throw it out as rubbish. We go by what the Bible says. Let God be true in every man a liar. Hallelujah. Let God be true and every man a liar. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm going by what the book says. God says, don't let anyone deceive you. Because there will be many deceived. That's what Jesus said. Hallelujah. And so, uh, there's a process. Hallelujah. You see? The process begins... When we confess and we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, but it does not end there. It does not end there. You have to, we have to take up our cross. Okay. We have to take up our cross. I don't care what anyone says. It's the same order in every, in every, in every thing that leads up to the transfiguration. It's the same order. Look at this. Matthew 17, the transfiguration. What's Matthew 16? I bet you it's the same order. I bet you it is. Okay. Peter confesses Christ. Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. Take up your cross. What's the next thing that happens? The transfiguration. What's, what, how about Mark 9? Is it the same? Is it the same order? Let's see. Because let God be true in every man a liar. Let's go. Mark 8. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Peter confesses Christ. Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. Take up your cross. What's the next event after you take up your cross? You're transfigured. Look at this. Luke chapter 9. What, is, what does God say? Is it the same order? Are we, are we, oh, I'm just so riled up now. I just want to scream, my goodness. But I know this is a teaching. Help me, Holy Ghost. Oh, I get so riled up because I, I let God be true. Is it the same order, yes or no? Are we, are we going to play semantics? Are we, are we going to let the Bible speak for itself? Are we, going to, are, we, are, are we just going to outright deny what the Bible says? Because God said that was going to happen too. God said that people will even come in the last days denying the Lord who bought them. That's how bad the deception is. My goodness. God has given us three different witnesses. Matthew, Mark, and Luke telling us the same order. You have to do it this way if you want to be transfigured on the dark and cloudy day. Hallelujah. Peter confesses Christ. We have to believe in his death and resurrection. And then we have to take up our cross. Now, now, now if you want to do it your way, hey, that's on you, but you ain't going to get very far. 
But if you want to do it God's way, this is the order. That's it. That's all. I'm going to preach what God says. This is the order. If you want to be transfigured. Now, if you don't want to be transfigured, well, hey, you're going to be left behind. Hey, but you know what? You see, God is so good because after the end of the transfiguration, there's still going to be people left. Because remember, the rapture is just the beginning of the day of the Lord. But God is going to heal people with an evil spirit. And that's why Jesus heals a boy with an evil spirit. This story comes right after the transfiguration because God is going to heal a lot of people during the time of Jacob's trouble. He's going to get all those evil spirits. And for those who come to him by faith during the time of Jacob's trouble, he's going to heal them. That's why this story is contained right after the transfiguration. Luke 9, Jesus heals a boy with an evil spirit. Mark 9, right after the transfiguration, Jesus heals a boy with an evil spirit. Matthew 17, the transfiguration, Jesus heals a boy with the demon. Okay, so after God performs the transfiguration, there's going to be people who are left behind during the time of Jacob's trouble, those last seven years of the earth's history and God of this age. And God is going to heal multitudes of people who have a demon because everyone who's left behind, they have an evil spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit. And this it, it's black and white with God. You either have the Holy Spirit or if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you have a demon. Okay. I mean, <laughs> people want to mince words. People don't want to call a spade a spade, but God says, anyone who is not with me is against me. Anyone who has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if you ain't got the spirit of God in you, if you ain't got the Holy Spirit, you got a demon. I don't care how you want to mince the words because Hasatan is your father if you don't have the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. And I'm not going to mince words. I'm going to cut it straight because God cuts it straight. You have a demon if you don't have the Holy Spirit. You have an evil spirit in you if you do not have the Holy Spirit. Spirit, let God be true and every man a liar. You have an evil spirit. If you ain't got the Holy Spirit in you, I don't care how much you smile in my face. I don't care how, how big your smiles are, how, how, how bright your eyes shine. If you don't confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Bible says you are antichrist. Okay, this is what the Bible says. Are you going to speak Bible or are you going to speak your own opinion? That's what it comes down to. And if you speak your own opinion, well, God says to beware. <laughs> That's the first thing he told me. I'm, 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 I'm weary. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm aware. Hallelujah. I, 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 I'm uh, by the power of the Holy Ghost. We have to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. God is good. I, I mean, hey, I kind of got, well, I didn't really get sidetracked because, you know, this is everything God wanted to say. So the transfiguration, this is what the whole teaching was about. We see the transfiguration and who appears with Jesus. James, Peter, and John go up to the mount. Let me read it. And verse one, Mark chapter nine. And he said unto them, verily, I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no full on earth can white them. And there appeared unto him Elijah and Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make the three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves. So we've come full circle, my friends. 
the New Testament revelation of the transfiguration, which is a picture of the rapture, told us to look at Elijah and Moses in the Old Testament to see the more sure word of prophecy, to understand that no prophecy was given by uh, the will of men. And therefore, there's no private interpretation because the Holy Spirit, which is God, has confirmed his word from the beginning, which tells us the end. And so as we looked in the beginning, we saw that Elijah represented those who had, who are going to be alive when it happens. And Moses represents those who are going to be dead when it happens. Both were taken up into a cave and both were hidden in the cave as a cloud uh, was also there. And in both instances, the Lord passed by. For Moses, there was no mention of an earthquake, of wind, or of fire, because Moses represents those who have died. They didn't; those who have died in Christ, they don't see, they don't see the complete picture of what's about to happen. Like those who are alive and remain, as Elijah, because in his story, in his shadow, he represents those who are alive because he never died. He went straight away up into heaven in the chariot of fire. And so from his perspective, when he was hidden, he saw the Lord pass by, but he was still sheltered. He was still safe. He was still raptured. Hallelujah. But he also saw the devastating effects of what comes upon the planet. He saw the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. Just like all of us alive today, we see what's about to happen. The wind is about to be released. The earthquake, the greatest earthquake in human history is about to be unleashed. And hailstones and coals of fire are about to be unleashed upon the planet. Hallelujah. And so, God is good. And I pray that this teaching was edifying. There's another teaching that I want to do here pretty soon uh, that God has put on my heart. But let me just let me just show you this right quick because this, uh, hallelujah. Amos chapter 8. So this is... This is the rapture in Amos chapter 8, but this tells us what, what happens for those who are left behind. So first we see verse 1. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said unto me, the end is come upon the, my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place, and they shall cast them forth with silence. And so we see that the basket of summer fruit is the basket of figs, because figs are summer fruit. And God tells us the parable of the fig tree. Learn that parable of the fig tree. When we see that the fig tree is about to blossom, summer is near. Matthew 24, now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves. You know that summer is near. So likewise you, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Truly I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And so we see that summer is almost here. And so uh, there's going to be a harvest. There's going to be a harvest. And that harvest is going to be the harvest of wheat, which also happens at the summer. The same time that the, the basket of summer fruit is harvested is also the same time when the wheat is harvested. But for those who are left behind, there's going to be many dead bodies in every place because God is going to pass by. Okay. God is going to pass by, as he says here. When the end comes upon his people, God is going to pass by, okay? And he passes by on the cloudy and dark day. And when he passes by for the rapture to get that basket of summer fruit to harvest the wheat, okay? For those who are left behind, when he passes by, there's howlings in that day. And there's many dead bodies in every place. Who, everyone who was left behind from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. And so 
uh, we see uh, an interesting thing because we have the wheat also mentioned in this story. Amos chapter 8, verse 4. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? And the Sabbath day that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. Okay, so we, two times wheat is mentioned. Okay, and these people who are left behind, God shows that their wicked intents are just to continually break the law. Okay, they don't want to follow any of his laws. Okay, they want to work on the Sabbath. Okay, because remember, he's speaking to Israel here because the seven year tribulation is all about Jacob's trouble. Okay, so the, he's talking to everyone who, who wants to live by the law. Well, they're going to die by the law. Okay, and so God says, you, you break the Sabbath. You want to sell wheat. Okay, you can't wait for the new moon to be gone. Okay, you don't want to honor his feast days. Okay, and then you want to trample upon the poor and you want to, you know, falsify all of your weights and balances in order to make more money. Everyone's greedy for gain. Okay, because you can't serve God and money. Okay. People who are left behind, okay, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof, okay? Man, but look at what God says, verse 7. So you see how, well, again, you see how the wheat is mentioned, okay? So remember, this all happens at the summer. The wheat is harvested and the basket of summer fruit, the figs, going hand in hand with Matthew 24 about the parable of the fig tree, okay? We know the, the other application because there's many applications to Scripture, we also know that that's Israel, Israel being back in the land, hallelujah. And we know that they just celebrated their 71st year. And so we know that summer is now coming upon us, okay? And so there's going to be a harvest when the Lord passes by. There's going to be a basket of summer fruit, okay? And also the wheat is mentioned twice. So it's happening at the wheat harvest as well when the Lord passes by. And when the Lord passes by, we know that it's with wind, with earthquake, and with fire. That's why when he passes by, there's howlings in that day. And there's many dead bodies in every place. And so we see that at the same time that this all happens, God says that he will never forget any of their works. Okay? that What a terrible epithet to have. God has forgotten our works as far as the east is from the west. Before the wicked, he says he's never going to forget any of their works. My goodness, the wrath of God against sin will be meted out in the lake of fire forever. Okay, because God is just. And so God also tells us in verse 9 that this happens. And it shall come to pass in that day, talking about when God passes by, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And I will turn your feast in the morning and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter day. Okay. So we see that when God passes by, uh, he's going to darken the earth in the clear day because the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. All, everyone's joy and gladness in the things of this world, he's going to turn it all into mourning. And then if you're left behind, everyone's going to wear sackcloth because there's no more fashion. And everyone's going to be bald-headed, okay? Because of all the radiation that's going to be in the atmosphere, everyone's hair is going to fall out, okay? And the end of it all is going to be a bitter day. And then God sends the ultimate famine. The ultimate famine in all of human history is sent during the time of the seven year uh, end of the age, okay? Not a, it's not a famine of bread or a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. People are going from sea to sea, from north even to the east, looking for the word of the Lord, but won't be able to find it because there's no more light. The body of Christ is out of here. We have the truth, and therefore the only two witnesses are going to be in Jerusalem, and they will prophesy for the first three and a half years, and they're going to be indestructible. But other than them two people, there's going to be nowhere to find the true word of God. The famine is going to be the greatest famine in all of human history because it's the day of darkness. Therefore, if you want to escape, 
Give your life to Jesus Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Hallelujah. Come to him today. Call upon him and save yourself from this perverse and wicked generation. For surely the day of the Lord is coming. Are you ready?